Hello, and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Tyler Liggett, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official group of the Institute, as well as the student assistant of the Intelligence Community Center of Academic Excellence. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu or talking to a student worker. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube shortly. You can also access videos of our past programming by going to the YouTube. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of these hearing aids. If you have a question about the loose system at any time or experience difficulty, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able to and ask just one brief question. If you are a part of the virtual audience, you may submit your questions at dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole's Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussions around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now please join me in welcoming, welcoming Director of the Programs and Student Affairs, Sarah Stacy. So thank you so much, Tyler. Good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2023 SAB program. So this year's topic, National Security, was chosen by the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, and the research, questions, and guest selection was done by this evening's moderator, SAB Student Coordinator, Catherine Magana. So Catherine is a senior majoring in political science and has done a stellar job in her role as SAB Coordinator for the past two years. We are gonna miss her a lot but we're new, we know she's gonna do really good for us outside these walls as well. So, this program is presented in partnership with KU's um, Intelligence Community Center of Academic Excellence. So please talk to Tyler after this program if you have any questions about the center. There's also some brochures on the back table. So, have a few announcements. I want all KU students to be aware that we have three awards that all have application deadlines for April 2nd. So if you have an internship and it's related to public service or politics or journalism, please check out our website. Um, this award helps offset some of the costs associated with an internship. Our other awards are open to only SAB members. So we have our Robert J. Dole Service to Country Award and Elizabeth Dole Public Service Award. Information can be found on our website, doleinstitute.org. Finally, I invite you to join us on Wednesday, April 12th and April 19th at 4 p.m. for the continuation of our discussion group series, Building Democracy in the 21st Century. So on April 12th, we'll have a conversation with the two co-chairs of the Kansas Future Caucus. It will be moderated by Katie Bernard of the Kansas City Star, who is also a former SAB member. And this is in partnership with the Millennial Action Project. On April 19th, um, so fan favorite, our formal, former fellow, Jerry Side, will return to moderate a conversation with Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, and New Mexico's Secretary of State, Maggie Talese Oliver. So this is in partnership with the Carter Center. So there's more information on your program handouts and the website, and you really won't want to miss these programs. So <laughs> enough announcements. 
Um, now I have the pleasure of handing things off to our moderator, moderator Heather Magana, who will then introduce tonight's guests, Tom Crawford and Michael German. Please give them all a round of applause. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that warm introduction, and thank you all for attending tonight's 2023 SAB program uh, and national security in the, in the age of surveillance. I'm really happy that you all can make it tonight, and we're joined by two amazing guests for this conversation on domestic terrorism, counterterrorism, surveillance, and privacy. Tonight, we are joined by our special guests. First, we have Tom Crawford on the far right. Tom is a retired special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He served 23 years in the FBI's Kansas City Division and then worked on the Joint Terrorism Task Force on international terrorism investigations. He later worked for the FBI's counter counterintelligence program and now teaches in the KU Law School as well as at the ICCAE. Mike German is a fellow with the Brennan Center for Justice's Liberty and National Security Program, which seeks to ensure that the US government respects human rights and fundamental freedoms in conducting the fight against terrorism. A former special agent with the FBI as well, his work focuses on law enforcement and intelligence oversight and reform. He joined the Brennan Center in 2014. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started with the interview. So as Tyler mentioned earlier, I will be, I will, uh, there will be time for questions at the end. I'll ask questions for about 40 minutes and then let you know when you should start thinking of your questions, <coughs> which you'll be able to ask to these two. Please just keep your questions short and keep it civil. Think of where you are, and it should be a great program. All right, gentlemen, so I'll go ahead and start off. So as I said previously, you're both former FBI special agents and have had careers in national security. So if you want, why don't you go ahead and tell me how you came into these positions, what those roles with the FBI were like, and what you did to get into those positions. So oh boy, you're, you're, you're the traveler. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I wanted to be an FBI agent from the time I was a little kid. Uh, my dad was an army officer. We didn't know any FBI agents. I don't know whether I got the idea from TV or whatever, but once I said I was going to be an FBI agent, they said, well, how do you become an FBI agent? And I did some research, and I couldn't add, so I couldn't be an accountant. Uh, I didn't understand science, so I knew that wasn't going to work. I couldn't speak a foreign language. Uh, so law school was going to be the easiest route for me to get in. Uh, so when my mother heard law school and my father heard FBI, they were both on board, and I never had to think about it again, and uh, was fortunate enough to get into law school uh, at, at Northwestern Chicago. And two weeks after I graduated from law school, I started at the FBI Academy uh, and uh, spent 16 years. I joined in 1988 which then there was the savings and loan crisis, which some of you might be old enough to remember. Uh, and back then, the Justice Department and FBI actually put elite fraud uh, artists in prison. Uh, so I worked on that case for four years, uh, one savings and loan case, uh, Lincoln Savings and Loan in California, uh, and was looking for something very different. And a colleague said, well, you have blonde hair and blue eyes, you could be a Nazi and asked me to work undercover uh, in a case he had targeting uh, neo-Nazis who had committed violence in and around uh, Los Angeles, California. And I spent the rest of my career working undercover in some form or fashion uh, for, the, for the next 12 years. And then, um, you know, having done terrorism cases, I was... Uh, aware as anybody in the FBI that there were some serious management problems with the way terrorism was being handled, so was not terribly shocked by 9-11, except the scale of it obviously was horrific, um, but became concerned with the way that the FBI started talking about reform, because they weren't talking about reforming the mismanagement of information, they were talking about collecting more information. And what I knew, and most Agents are curious people, and right after the attacks happened, we started calling our friends. Who knows how this happened? Who knows what mistakes were made? So everything that was in the 9-11 Commission report, we basically knew within two weeks, and yet what the FBI and the Justice Department and the Bush administration were putting out was this was a failure of intelligence. This was because our intelligence authorities have been narrowed. Uh, after the Church Committee investigation, we have to 
expand those authorities and gather more intelligence. Well, if, if the problem was actually the management of information, right, we had agents in New York, agents in Minneapolis, agents in Phoenix, agents in San Diego, agents all across the country who had done their jobs and collected evidence and, and reported it up the chain of command where it was being mismanaged and assets that could have addressed these problems were being mismanaged. So now all they were doing was opening the spigots to more collection that was going to have a, uh, a, a harsher effect on Americans who, who were, weren't doing anything wrong. Uh, and uh, that information was all going to go into the same <laughs> mismanaged system that was only going to lead to not just abuses of civil rights and civil liberties, but continuing security failures. Um, and I was just a special agent. I decided the best I could do is just do my job the best of my ability and uh, volunteered to do another undercover assignment that involved uh, 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 United States supporters of a Middle Eastern terrorist group who had reached out to a white supremacist group seeking their assistance based on their shared hatred of Jews. And it was a really good opportunity for the FBI to look good after having failed so miserably after 9-11. Um, but the case was just terribly mismanaged to the point that the opportunity was being lost. So I decided to report that, you might remember it around this time, Colleen Rowley, uh, uh, FBI agent in Minneapolis who was aware of one of the failed investigations that they had tried to get started before 9-11, wrote a letter to Mueller explaining that, it, I think it, and getting to know her later, she was trying to, <laughs> because what Mueller was saying publicly wasn't accurate, and she was trying to warn him that I was in Minneapolis when we were trying to get this case going, and you're saying inaccurate things about the case that might harm an ultimate prosecution. So, you know, here's the true information. Uh, and after that controversy, uh, then Director Robert Mueller said, if anybody wants to, uh, or if any agent knows of a mismanaged terrorism investigation, I want you to report it. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't want you to report it. I did report it, and uh, that was pretty much the end of my FBI career. Uh, uh, I was taken off of that case, told I would never work undercover again, and uh, kind of put in a penalty box. And I tried for two years to get the issues resolved, but, uh, but ultimately they wouldn't do it. So I decided to report to Congress and leave, leave the FBI. And, uh, ended up get, going to work for the ACLU, like all good agents do, right? <laughs> and worked at the ACLU for seven years on, on uh, national security policy questions and their impact on civil rights. And after seven years there, got hired at the, the Brennan Center. So, how did I become an FBI agent? Um, I had wanted to serve, but I did not go into the military because I was very correctly advised by my father that I would not follow orders well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd never lost that desire, though. Uh, I was in law school. Um, those were dark times uh, back in the early 90s when lawyers were getting laid off. And so thinking of what to do. And so I applied to the FBI. I applied to the CIA. I applied to several USAC agencies with that thought in mind of wanting to serve my country somehow. They were not hiring uh, at that point either. Uh, it was not a good time to be looking for a job in the 90s uh, mm -hmm. or in 91. Um, but I did graduate law school and I, I began practicing law. Now, I didn't start off doing this, but I think I hold the distinction of being the only FBI agent who was a legal aid attorney before he became an agent. And I was a legal aid attorney in Kansas City, Kansas for three years prior to becoming a, an agent. Um, and so I'd, I'd practice, now the blue, uh, and I was talking about this with one of the students at dinner. Uh, I was called by the FBI, asked if I still wanted to go, and this is five years after I'd put my initial application <laughs> in, five years. Uh, I was doing well, I was actually getting ready to move up with a different practice. My wife was a prosecutor locally, we were talking about starting a family, all that kind of thing. 
Talked to my wife about it. She asked me, do you really still want to do this? And I thought about it hard, and I said, yes, I do still want to do it. And she agreed to go along with it, uh, and I went through that process. It still took a year. After that, you go through a lot of tests to become a special agent. At that point in time, there was, I think, four different, one of them was like taking an, a, an ACT test, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, it was like math and science, like you're taking this thing, like what in the heck has this got to do with being an FBI agent? If you remember. Uh, interviews, things like that. Uh, and after I got through the process, I didn't hear anything, thought, okay, we're moving on, and I got a phone call, say, you got a class to go to Quantico on Monday, they called me on Thursday the week before. So the other attorneys in my office weren't very happy. I dumped 288 cases on those lawyers, packed up on that Sunday, and went to Quantico with my wife being four months pregnant. Mm -hmm. So it was a sea change for me um, to, to, to go in the Bureau. But, I mean, having said that, I, you know, I went through it an interesting time. I went through in 1995 is when I went to Quantico. And so we had the first government shutdowns when Bill Clinton was president. Uh, there was a lot of turmoil. That was a lot of the initial turmoil from the government uh, started. It was an interesting time to be back there. The key thing for me was is that they had told me going in that there was no question I would be sent somewhere else in the United States. There was no way I would be sent back home. I mean, that was just, you understood that. And that was one of the big considerations for my wife, who was a prosecutor and wanted to continue working. You know, so where would we go? And you know, at Quantico, they have you list you know, there's 56 field divisions all in the United States, and as a, in your new agents class, you get to list one through 56, where would you prefer to go? Not that they care where you want to go, but they at least give you the mirage of, of it. So, you know, I put Washington, D.C., number one. They were sending 10 people, every new agents class, leading up to mine. And the day comes to get the orders, and I open up my orders, Kansas City. They sent me home. One of the funniest memories of that day is all of the instructors for your class, there's like 30 or 40 of them standing in the back. And I was being last name with a C, I was the, one of the early ones in my group to open mine, and they're like, I didn't know what to say. I, and I looked, and I actually showed it to the assistant director. I'm like, is that right? And he goes, yeah. I'm screaming at me, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. And 40 unit voices in unison said that bunch of bad curse words <laughs> yeah. at me uh, in the back. Yeah. That's really pretty funny. <laughs> And as I've always said, I was smart enough, uh, once I got sent to Kansas City, to never leave. Um, when I started, I was working, I started, I did healthcare fraud for a little bit, but the majority of my time prior to 9-11 was spent working violent crime. And if you lived here back then, in the late 90s up through 2000, the metro area was setting records every year for kidnappings, bank robberies, homicide, drugs. Now, it was one cartel, uh, drug groups really started moving into the Midwest and particularly Kansas City at that point in time. So it was, Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas were incredibly violent places back then. And I was on the squad, which at that time it was called the Violent Crime Squad or re in the Bureau term was called the Reactive Squad because what that meant, we were always reacting to something that had taken place. We were reacting to a bank robbery. We were reacting to a drug deal gone down. We were reacting to a kidnapping that had taken place, okay? And so that was the squad I was on. And you know, when you're a young agent, I mean, you're, you know, you used to call it, you're out there, you know, you're literally chasing the bad guys. And it's high, high speed, high stress. And you do understand what it means to carry a gun for a living at that point in time as an FBI agent. Now, 9 11, everything changed for me. So I was working, you know, drugs and gangs at that point. And I was told one afternoon that I was going to be transferred onto the Joint Terrorism Task Force specifically to take over, a, to, a, to open a criminal case on what had been a historic intelligence case uh, involving links to Al-Qaeda. And this case had been worked as an intelligence case, and it, it involved a, a charity out in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, it became my life's work in the FBI. I worked that case for 10 years total. It didn't, it, it existed as an open investigation for 21 years. It was the third Islamic charity designated by the US government as a specially designated global terrorist organization following 9-11. That occurred in 2004. Um, it was, a, you know, got a lot of publicity at the time. Uh, 
for me, what it meant was is that I traveled all over the world. Uh, I learned everything I would ever want to know about Al-Qaeda, who made up Al-Qaeda, how Al-Qaeda operated, where they operated. I became uh, fluent in how money was moved throughout the world on behalf of terrorist organizations. Um, I was given this title. I didn't, again, didn't raise my hand for this. Uh, one of the things the FBI did after 9-11 is they created what was called the Terrorism Finance Operations Section as part of the International Terrorism D uh, Division. And that, the specific purpose of TFOS, as it was called, was to follow the money, uh, specifically to Al-Qaeda and transition into ISIS, because you cannot have a successful operation unless it's funded, right? You can't build a bomb unless you have money to buy the parts. So. I became responsible for supervising every open international terrorism investigation in the Kansas City Division because every investigation was mandated to have a financial component. So I got to be very fluent in banks and money distribution businesses, whether you're talking about Western Union or anything similar to that. Uh, and as a result of that, that led me into d doing a lot of teaching within the FBI get tagged with being an SM, a subject matter expert and stuff, and so off you go. And so it, it uh, led me to getting involved in a lot of other in, uh, terrorism investigations around the country, going in to give you know, our experience in Kansas City, how we'd work certain things. And that kind of you know, whetted my appetite to, you know, one day I'm gonna retire and I would like to teach. And we started a program at the Commander General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth that I was a part of for roughly 10 years where we were going and, and teaching soldiers getting ready to deploy to either Iraq or Afghanistan on international terrorism issues and specifically uh, money issues, evidence collection. Um, one of the things I'm proudest of, we helped train uh, special forces on, who are deploying into Iraq and if, uh, at the initial stages of the invasion in 03 on how to seize uh, evidence properly in order that if we, if we could tie it back to an investigation that we'd actually use that evidence seized in Iraq in US federal court. At the time, people thought we were nuts. It had never been done before, it was unheard of, the military had no mechanism to do this. But myself and another person, we would go down to McDill Air Force Base regularly, train these guys. Well, as it turned out for us, in this one specific case I referenced before out of Columbia, uh, we ended up having evidence that was seized in Iraq that was sent back to us as part of that initial uh, effort. So it, it, pay, it actually paid direct dividends specific to our investigation, which was enormously surprising. So, you know, it had a lot to do with that. I, I had a unique career in Kansas City in that because of the cases that I was assigned to, I worked with the entire U.S. intelligence community. And when I say I worked with them, I did it operationally. It wasn't some theoretical exercise. I was working investigations with them. And I worked with many, many foreign intelligence services and law enforcement agencies as well. I had a lot of stamps in my official government passport and my time in the JTTF traveling around. And that gave me a lot of uh, exposure to how other countries go about doing their business. And you know, more importantly, uh, how unique other countries viewed the United States and our legal system. Um, I think it's interesting in listening to Mr. German, everybody has their own experience to draw from. I had a lot of encounters with foreign intelligence service and law enforcement people where they would look at me and say, why don't you guys just kill this person? Why are you, why are you trying to build a case to go to court? Didn't even wasn't even a thought, depending on what country you're in, especially at that point in time in the Middle East, it was, I would say, frisky, okay? Um, and I had a lot of conversations about why and, or, or how important uh, the United States system of justice is, and specifically what due process is. Had a lot of conversations with folks, and they would just look at me, because they didn't understand it. They don't have due process in those countries, and even some of our allies in Europe don't go about this the same way. And so I had a lot of conversations about that type of, of inquiry. And, and it, you know, over time, it made me realize that you know, what our system 
of, of laws and regulations, actually, it makes, our, it makes the job of not just FBI, but anybody who's working in the U.S. intelligence community trying to work a terrorism case or a counterintelligence case, for that matter, makes it very difficult. A lot of hurdles you have to overcome in order to effectively investigate something. And so having that experience and having those conversations and seeing how different corners of the world operated made me really have an appreciation for our system and how we go about doing things. And I say that too as somebody who had practiced law for over four years before I became an agent, used to going into court, you know, I litigated every day, I did stuff in state and federal courts, things of that nature. So what, that wasn't new to me in the sense that I knew how our system worked, obviously, but when you put it into the context of chasing terrorists around the world and how their countries are approaching that, uh, it, it gave it a different perspective. Um, and so I did that, you know, we had, one of the crazy things about Kansas City, we had some extraordinarily high profile and relevant Al-Qaeda cases, one after the other after the other. And I worked on almost all of them. Um, very proud of the work that we did as a group. Uh, that Joint Terrorism Task Force we had was extraordinary. Uh, and we did a lot of, we did a lot of good. Um, but after about 11 years of doing that, I, I was, you know, kind of hit the wall and asked to move over to counterintelligence. So counterintelligence, of course, everybody thinks of that as, oh my God, that's James Bond and you know, Jack Ryan and all that stuff. And I am sitting here to tell you that that is the farthest thing from the truth as humanly possible. One of my favorite sayings that I learned as a young agent, uh, from an older agent, we were complaining about our you know, 15th generation computers. And this older agent looked at me and goes, you gotta remember this saying. In the FBI, we call it yesterday's technology tomorrow. <laughs> And it's true. Um, I don't think the general American public understands that, and I say this with a special reference to the FBI, because we are always the last USIC agency on the low bid spectrum. Uh, agents and analysts in the Bureau are asked to do more with less than any other USIC agency, particularly when it comes to technology. Okay? Uh, the notion that agents <coughs> can spin a dial and surveil somebody is pure, utter nonsense, fiction, okay? The processes that you go through in order to instigate something like that are extraordinary to say the least and very difficult to fulfill, all right? So when you move over to counterintelligence, what happens? Well, you're no longer worried about terrorism, you're worried about state actors. And these, in the time I moved over, the emphasis was turning into China. And of course, the big three are China, Russia, and Iran, there are other ancillary countries. I mean, North Korea obviously is a problem. There are some countries that we all consider to be allies who like to try and get our secrets too, okay? And what counterintelligence really is, is protect it, protecting secrets. And it is, there is a lot of darkness to that world. There is a lot of clandestine activity. There is a lot of covert activity that goes on in CI because that is the realm of spies, okay? The US spies on people, people spy on the United States. And so there's offense and defense. And I'm, I'm getting into this because I, I teach two classes this semester on counterintelligence, so I'm going to start riffing on this. But, you know, it's offense and defense. And you know, you're trying to protect what we have, and you're also trying to acquire what we need. Every country on the planet, almost, and that's, I can't say that universally, many, many, many countries on the planet are engaged in this activity. Okay? FBI's responsibility is defense. Okay? when it comes to counterintelligence. CIA's responsibility is offense. Other, U other USIC agencies fit into that spectrum at different points in different places. Some may have responsibilities for one or both, but in the black and white scheme of things on CI, it's FBI defense, CIA offense, NSA's you know, helping too. Military, different in the sense that whether we're talking about the Defense Intelligence Agency or the combatant commands, their intelligence is geared toward the battlefield and predicted modeling on battlefields. They're trying to figure out what the enemy's gonna do, whether that be Iraq or Afghanistan. Right now, what is the military doing? They're doing predictive modeling on what happens if the United States have to get, get involved in the ground in Ukraine, or what happens if we get into a shooting war with China over Taiwan. That's their intel focus, okay? It's just to try and paint that picture. So I did that for eight years. Uh, one of the things that we did that was kind of different, hadn't been done before in Kansas City, is we actually took some CI cases and went criminal. 
and indicted people. In one of those cases, the last trial I had as an agent was a theft of trade secrets case on a private business out in Junction City, Kansas. And at that time, we got the second long, long, longest sentence for those two defendants in US history for a theft of trade secrets case. And what I can tell you sitting here, five years removed, retired five years ago, what I can tell you sitting here having worked this, when you hear these things about the threats going on these days, China, Russia, what's going on trying to obtain secrets, technology or otherwise, it's very true. And it's an all day, every day exercise. And one thing I ask you to keep in mind before, I, before we move forward is, when it comes to terrorism or, or specifically counterintelligence in the FBI, we might have a couple thousand agents working those issues across the world. Now, we've got 330 million people in the United States. You think about how much actual <coughs> ground that we have to cover just covering the United States. A couple thousand people. If China decides they want to target, let's just say they want to target Boeing because Boeing's got a sexy airplane coming out. They'll put 20,000 people on that one point of acquisition. I'm not exaggerating. Okay? So it's a huge difference. FBI is relatively small when it comes to organizational size. And I marry that up with what I said prior about our technological adversity that we are constantly faced with. So it's not, you know, I think, I'll finish my initial with this. People, because of the environment we've lived in in the last five, six, seven, eight years, FBI and the rest of the USIC, for that matter, has been very politicized. Uh, it's been painted with a certain brush. These are not monolithic organizations, okay? FBI agents and FBI analysts, support staff, their husbands and wives, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, they take care of their grandparents when they get old, they take care of their parents when they get old. I didn't leave Kansas City because my parents were older and needed, you know, I had to stay to take care of them. I could have taken a promotion and moved on. They coach little league teams, they're scout masters, they're going to parent-teacher conferences. In other words, they're human beings like everybody else. There's this effort that, that has been made to view the organization as this all-encompassing, menacing, monolithic type deal. And I just, I, it's so wrong because in reality, it's people, trying to do a very difficult job every day. And it is a very difficult job. I would say it's one of the hardest jobs anybody could do anywhere because of the responsibility you're given as an individual, what our mission is to protect this country and the citizens of this country from attacks, espionage, setting aside the white collar crime, the drugs and gangs and everything else. You try and keep that in mind, it's people. It's not some scary thing that it's been painted with this politicization that we've seen the last several years. And I'll end with that. Uh, in a, as briefly as you can, do you think you could explain just for the audience the differences in uh, agencies like the CIA, NSA, and FBI, and how they handle privacy and national security differently? You're probably. Well, what I tell my students is, <clears throat> is that the big, the, the big difference between FBI and CIA is this in simplest terms. FBI enforces the laws of the United States. The CIA breaks the laws of foreign countries. That's what an espionage agency does. And it's really that black and white. The rest of the USIC agencies have roles on both the, as I say, both offense and defense. Now CIA operates 180 degrees different than the FBI or any other agency for that matter um, because they are engaged in, in foreign intelligence gathering. Um, one, of the th one of the points I make to my students is they, you know, they, because I have a lot of students come to me and they're, they want to be an FBI agent or a CIA agent, you know, what does that mean? And I always make a point of, you know, what is a non-official cover agent for the CIA? And you've seen movies, you know, with the Mission Impossibles and they talk about the knock list or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But what is a non-official cover agent? It is someone who has agreed to give up their entire identity and life to serve their country. If you're a knock, you cut ties with your family, friends, everyone. You have a new identity, you're sent somewhere you've probably never been before, and if you are captured, caught and captured, doing what you're doing, chances are it's not going to end well for you. 
So CIA, for all the times in my career that I wanted to throttle them for getting, you know, not being as user-friendly as I needed them to be, I will always have amazing, tremendous respect for those folks. Because I can sit here and say, again, I'm not, this isn't me trying to pat myself on the back, but, you know, yeah, was I in harm's way a lot? Yeah. I was never in harm's way like those kind of people, all right? And so that's another thing I was, when I taught, when I used to, I used to do a ton of public speaking for the Bureau. I was always, always trying to make this point. Remember that there are your fellow citizens out there putting their life at risk for you. And I, you know, that's what it comes down to. And so that FBI, CIA, that's kind of the black and white for me. Thank you. Uh, would you mind, uh, Michael, you were talking to me a little bit about this earlier. Uh, go over how government surveillance related or in the name of counterterrorism has kind of changed in the last two decades from 9-11 to January 6th. Uh, so considerably and almost immediately after 9-11, uh, the USA Patriot Act was passed it, within a month of 9-11, long before the 9-11 Commission or Congress could analyze what had gone wrong at the FBI and the CIA and the NSA. Uh, they basically took every request that they had made in previous years that had been refused by Congress and put them all in one package, called it the Patriot Act, and, and put it forward. And, and essentially what it did was amend a lot of different laws, including the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, which allows the FBI to obtain warrants from a, or prior to 9-11, to obtain warrants from a secret court to do foreign intelligence uh, electronic monitoring and searches, uh, the Bank Secrecy Act, which I'm sure Tom had a lot of experience working with, uh, to basically expand these authorities uh, to lower the threshold of evidence necessary to obtain it. So rather than needing probable cause for a search warrant, uh, the FBI only needed um, what they call the relevance standard to obtain uh, someone's cell phone records, the metadata that they collected. So that was passed right away, uh, but almost immediately as well, there were some extra legal things that the Bush administration put in place that later became known as the President's Surveillance Program. This was a program that was in violation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which under its own wording said this is the exclusive method for conducting foreign intelligence collection in the United States. And this secret President's Surveillance Program allowed the government to obtain all of our it, it telephone metadata with no finding that any of us had done anything wrong. Uh, it allowed the collection of content that was going overseas, so phone calls that somebody was having with somebody overseas or business transactions, again, uh, tracing the money became a big part of uh, what they were trying to do. Uh, so we had, it, it, the way I've explained it in, in my writing is a change in attitude along with a change in architecture. The architecture allowed for more aggressive collection against people that were not suspected of doing anything wrong, and the attitude that counterterrorism was the top priority and w we needed to get the information and, and figure out what to do with it later allowed this massive collection. Uh, and it, at the same time, right about the same time, the FBI's internal rules changed, the Attorney General guidelines that uh, govern FBI investigations, again, to lower the threshold to where a person could be investigated. So your good conduct no longer protects you from being investigated. The FBI has much more authority to target people with much less evidence to believe they're doing anything wrong. Um, those rules, the, the secret programs were, were first acknowledged in, tw in 2005 through, through a New York Times article that exposed it. Uh, that started a lot of conversations about whether to renew certain sections of the Patriot Act. I testified in some of those hearings and had members of Congress wag their finger at me and say, you can't point to any serious abuses of this law. 
and I would try to explain gently that it's a secret law <laughs> that allows secret collection. And you know, it, I, I agree with Tom. You know, m my colleagues in the FBI, for the most part, were people that I, I would trust with anything. But that's not how our democracy works. And giving an agency that has failed significantly in the past and has harmed civil liberties that kind of secret authority without aggressive oversight and public accountability is inevitably going to lead to abuse. Uh, in 2013, Edward Snowden released the scope of what was going on. It was fascinating because in the twice that I testified of, uh, regarding Patriot Act reauthorizations that were always reauthorized, uh, the, most of the focus was on national security letters because there had been some abuse of those letters that, that had become public. So most of the discussion was about that, and there was this other program, Section 215, that allowed the FBI to collect any tangible thing uh, uh, based on rel the FBI's interpretation of relevance uh, to an investigation. Very low standard. Um, they, they had used it, I think the one year I testified, they had used it nine times. The next time I testified, three years later, they had used it 13 times. It didn't seem like this was something that, that was open to abuse because they were using it so seldom. But when Edward Snowden released a lot of documents, what we found was it only took four of those to collect all the cell phone metadata from every American across the United States every day to put in, in a big intelligence database. So you, you, you can't know what you don't know. And that's, again, not the way democracy works. We're supposed to have oversight in Congress, oversight in the foreign intelligence surveillance courts, and it was, you know, one of the congressmen who wagged his finger at me and said, I can't point to abuse, called himself the father of the Patriot Act. He said he claimed authorship of it, and he claimed after Edward Snowden's leaks revealed the scope of how Section 215 was being used, that he had never imagined that that section could be used that way. So here's, here's the person who's supposed to be conducting aggressive oversight of it who doesn't even understand how it's being used, that, that it's that secret it, how these uh, uh, efforts are, are put in place. So because of, of the, the, the 2005 leak and the 2013 Edward Snowden leaks, there were efforts to try to get some control over this. And the Foreign Intelligence Court, this, for, this secret court that sits in Washington, D.C., started creating minimization requirements, they called it. Basically a rule book for the FBI to follow in secret. Uh, but over and over again, what they would find is that the, the FBI and the other intelligence agencies were not following these rules when nobody was watching. And they kept having to modify them and modify them and modify them. Uh, finally, Section 215 was, was uh, at first turned over to the private sector. They asked the phone companies to keep these records rather than having the government do it, but ultimately it was allowed to expire a few years ago. Uh, but there's another section, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, Section 702, uh, which is coming up for renewal and is part of the debate because just recently the Office of the Director of National Intelligence has acknowledged that there are further abuses even past the ones that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court found. Um, interestingly, the FBI's rules were expanded once more in 2008, and that created the uh, authority to conduct what they call assessments. And they don't call them threat assessments because no threat is necessary. Uh, agents are allowed to open these assessments based on their own initiative, so long as their intention is to be fighting crime, uh, preventing terrorism, or uh, uh, threats to national security. So this assessment is, is basically an unpredicated investigation. There's no evidence to believe that the person has done anything wrong, but it allows a lot of fairly aggressive uh, 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 tools, including the, the recruitment and tasking of informants. So the FBI can send an informant into a group to collect information about what that group is doing without any evidentiary basis to believe they've broken any law or done anything wrong. Uh, so these are really broad authorities that are very easy to abuse, and unfortunately we've seen over the course of the 
research I've been doing on, on these things since I left the FBI that, that you know, just like back in the bad old days under J. Edgar Hoover, that who agents tend to focus on are people who they have some bias against, some political bias, religious bias, you know, obviously after 9-11, after there was a lot of anti-Muslim animus in the United States, and as Tom said, these are people. <laughs> there are people who live in our country, and the biases that exist in our country exist in, in the FBI as well. Uh, and you know, it, at the ACLU, uh, when I was there in 2011, we uh, used the Freedom of Information Act to get uh, counterterrorism training materials that, sure enough, were uh, included some really awful, biased uh, information, factually uh, erroneous, which, which is, you, you know, and, and again, riffing off of something Tom said, because he's right. The FBI is an incredibly small organization. It's only 30, 35,000 employees, varies over the years, only 12,000 agents across the whole country and around the world. Right? It's a very small agency, but has a very big impact because of all the power that it's given. And what we have to do, you know, part, there's always this idea that you balance privacy against security. You balance civil rights against security. But that's, that's not accurate, right? The, 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 you know, we were talking over dinner that, you know, Saddam Hussein had a lot of surveillance in his country. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't think people felt safe, right? Uh, you know, nor were they safe, obviously. Uh, so, you know, our, and this actually, it was, it was really well explained by the, uh, President Obama set up a, a committee to understand the, the Edward Snowden program leaks, so Section 215 and Section 702. And they explained in their, in their preamble that privacy is a type of security, that you can't balance security against security, right? We don't lock our door just because we don't want somebody to read our papers. That keeps us safe. That keeps us secure. And if our papers, which of course now are kept in the cloud <laughs> at, at your uh, internet service provider, at the social media uh, programs you listen to, if that isn't safe, then you aren't safe. And unfortunately, the, the, the way that the, the, the paradigm has moved is to where if it exists in data, the government believes they can get it. And, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating that recent debate over TikTok, right, and uh, Congress, and, you know, I, I'm not a technologist, I don't know a lot about how the technology works, but I am entirely convinced that TikTok collects way too much information <laughs> about us if you have that app uh, on your phone, but so do all the others, and all those others sell that data, so while I am concerned, like Tom said, about Chinese government agents who are coming into our, our country to do harm. I'm also concerned about companies that are selling <laughs> this data about us, and I'm concerned about the law enforcement infrastructure we've built. I mean, one of the uh, other layers of intelligence <laughs> collection in the United States are state and local intelligence fusion centers. How many of you have heard of state and local intelligence fusion centers? That, I've done a terrible job as an advocate. I started writing about these things in 2007 and published my last report on it uh, just last December. Uh, these are, are ostensibly state and local entities, uh, mostly law enforcement led. Sometimes uh, some of them are actually housed within the FBI. Uh, they include state and local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, National Guard, private sector participants, <laughs> poorly defined, so private companies, contractors, all collecting information about us and sharing that information broadly across the information sharing platforms uh, with very little oversight about what they're doing. And in 2020, they got hacked and some 200 gigabytes of information was released that was information our tax dollars were used to collect information about us 
that it was then taken from these entities. So it's, it's not improving our security, it's a security vulnerability that we've created with this impression that collecting this data is somehow gonna keep us safer when actually it puts us more at risk. Well, I have a million more questions for the two of you, but I think it's time to turn it to a Q&A for the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and Will or Angela with the mics will come to you and hold the microphone for you to ask your question. I think we have one over here and one over here. So two of the values that I've always seen in every member of the intelligence community that I've had the privilege of meeting, including you two, are community service and patriotism. I was reading the recent Wall Street Journal article that was showing how much those have plummeted as core values of our country recently. I was just curious if you have any thoughts on the direction that that could take the intelligence agencies in the near future if you start to draw from a pool of unpatriotic or non-service-minded individuals. You're not going to staff the USIC if you don't have people who want to do service. You're certainly not going to staff them effectively. Um, there is something to be said that to work at a USIC agency is a calling. Just like if you want to join, if you desire to join the military, it's a calling. I've heard it a million times, you don't join the FBI to get rich. I mean, I could have made a lot more money practicing law in my career. Okay? Um, you do it because you do want to serve. Um, and that, that mindset, I think, is essential. You have to be willing to sacrifice. I mean, look, I spent six years out of 10 away from my family. I was gone away from home for six years out of a 10-year span. And there's a cost to that. Okay? Um, you have to be willing to serve. Uh, I got I, I to take one second, though, because I, I don't want to turn this into point-counterpoint, but mm. I got to take issue with a couple of things you said. One, I don't think it's fair to try and conflate the Snowden surveillance issue that had nothing to do with the FBI. That was an NSA program, okay? Well, it's the FBI nope. who uses nope. the data. Section 702. <laughs> FBI did not was not part of that program. FBI does the backdoor searches. Nope. FISA applications, Mike. The, the, what, what year did you retire? The, the Office of the Director Before? of National Intelligence just put out a report no, acknowledging the FBI. You can't used speak it. in generalities are, about this. There stuff. are four FISA court opinions criticizing yeah, the FBI I'm, for I'm its well use of, of this authority. What you said paints a picture that is inaccurate. Point out a couple of other things. 9 11 was a sea change for the USIC. The policy that governed the United States intelligence community was put in effect in 1947, the National Security Act of 47. It was not updated or amended until 2004. Okay? Congress didn't think it was necessary. One of the failures leading up to 9-11 was the fact that there was not information exchanged, particularly between CIA and FBI. It was called stovepiping. It was a huge problem. So what happens after 9-11? There was a mass panic. What you don't remember after 9-11 was is there was also anthrax attacks that happened across the country. There was one that happened down in Wichita, Kansas that I had to go respond to. FBI was told in the span of less than 24 hours after 9-11 that you had to stop being a reactive agency and start being an agency that prevents crime, specifically terrorist incidences from occurring, not just in the United States, but against U.S. persons anywhere. There was no infrastructure that existed to accommodate that mandate that we were given from not just the White House, but from Congress. It was invented on the fly. Now, were there mistakes made? Absolutely. And I will be the last person who is an FBI agent who served as long as I did who will ever sit here and defend FBI management. You won't hear that from me. It's not a meritocracy, okay? But you can't generalize and try and put all of that, the way you're stating it makes it think one agency wasn't responsible for all of it. It's not, it's not accurate. 
Bureau had, you bring up the Bank Secrecy Act. The Bank Secrecy Act was passed in 1907 under the Nixon administration. Why? Because they had to address organized crime and drug activity. BSA was not updated or changed in any way until the Patriot Act after 9-11. Banks were not reporting as they were required under the Bank Secrecy Act properly on customer activity. One of the things we discovered was it was easy as could be to open accounts anonymously and exchange change, and send money, wire money anywhere in the world. It was a huge problem. Banks weren't reporting. I used to go to anti money laundering conferences all over to help train these people on what they were supposed to look for and how to properly issue the reports they were supposed to. It was a sea change, 9-11 was, for banking, financial houses, and the people who ran them. You had to have resources devoted that didn't exist prior to, okay? National security letters, were they used before 9-11? Absolutely they were. National security lever, letters used to have to be approved by the director of the FBI or the deputy director of the FBI. The Patriot Act changed that to where the special agent in charge of a field office had the authority to issue a national security letter. What's an NSL? It's an administrative subpoena. I issued, I can't even tell you how many I issued. Never once were those issued out of anything other than what was called a full investigation, okay? The levels of review that were in place before those were issued, no agent just sent that out in the mail. It went through a supervisor. It went through the general counsel of the FBI field office, reviewed by the assistant special agent in charge and the special agent in charge. A FISA application, in other words, the secret wiretap, at least 10 levels of review before that thing went to the judge. If you had a prosecution involved, even a potential one down the road, that FISA application was also reviewed by the assistant United States line attorney on, assigned to the case, likely the U.S. attorney of that office, and Department of Justice. No FISA application makes it before the FISA court judge unless that thing's been signed off on by extraordinarily multiple layers of, of review and approval. And it's always been that way. No individual agent can get a FISA approved. No individual agent, in my experience, and I'll, I'll narrow it to my experience, no individual agent can submit an application on their own. I don't want to cut you off, Tom, but I do want to make sure that we get to everyone's questions who has them. Do we have a question over here? You've, you've done a good job, I think, of letting us know that the agents, the field agents, are doing the best they can with what they have to work with. Is the problem, and I think the answer is gonna be yes, but I want you guys to confirm it. Is the problem with the FBI, CIA, the agency management, or the clowns that we send to Washington every two years and every six years? Well, you're setting me up, we're being recorded, so using uh, clowns, yeah, I'll get me in trouble. Hey, I'm hanging out there too. No, look. <laughs> Look, there, there is, there, the, the, one of the big changes that happened in the FBI after 9-11 is, is that Director Mueller inflated the size of FBI headquarters exponentially. I don't, even, I don't even know what the percentage is. But the numbers of agents that were assigned to headquarters grew by the thousands. And that meant there was less agents in the field available to work, not just terrorism, but anything. They created positions that there weren't people to staff and Mueller demanded that those positions get staffed. And so what that meant is, is they dropped the requirements it took for you to go into the management program. As a field agent, the highest GSA pay level you can get is a 13. So a supervisor is a 14, an ASAC is a 15, and then there's, there's executive service levels within that. They created all these 14 and 15 positions they couldn't staff. So then all of a sudden we had people with three years in the FBI who were going back to 14 on a substantive desk in terrorism. Didn't work then and it's not working now, okay? And they have yet to figure out how to fix that problem. Um, and that's nothing new, it's not secret, it's been written about plenty of times before. It's why I say I, I'm not an apologist for that system at all. Uh, it frustrated me quite a bit in my career. I can't speak to how the other agencies are 
constructed. What I can tell you is the folks who I worked with, I had friends at all these different agencies that I knew over the years, there has been a cycle in the, you know, roughly since 2016 of mass retirements and people quitting. It used to be unheard of that you would hear of an FBI agent with 15 years in quitting. It was unheard of that analysts at CIA who had 20 years in resigned. That has happened quite a bit in the last five to 10 years. And so there's, there's you know, and frankly, morale's also been hit tor tor uh, horribly. So that's a combination of factors that, that doesn't help getting the job done effectively. You know, what I would say too, and Mike will jump in here, but when it comes to the protection of the American people's civil rights, the first line of defense is the individual agent. Um, it is the individual agent that is going to initiate nine times out of ten, nine and a half times out of ten is going to initiate the opening of a case. And my, again, I will speak only to my experience. I never saw in my 23 years anyone attempt to initiate an investigation based on prejudice of political view, race, sex, preference, anything. The case was open because that individual or individuals, and, that, and by individual I could also mean a, a corporate business entity, had done something to put them on the radar. And that something had to look like something illegal that needed to be investigated to determine whether it was illegal. And I had plenty of cases that I started that I closed because you couldn't get it there. But you had to go through the process. You had to at least make the effort to determine whether or not there was actually illegality involved. Uh, there was a uh, congressional investigation into the Whitey, Whitey Bulger fiasco at the FBI. I don't know, an informant that the FBI mishandled. Uh, FBI agent was actually convicted, I believe, of murder uh, related to that, the handling of that informant. Um, uh, uh, hearing was, hearings were held in Congress and a report was generated, which I, I bring up just because of its title. Its title was, Everything Secret Degenerates. And I think that can be applied to any of these programs and any of these agencies, right? You know, we all have a room in our house that when guests come over, we just shut the door there, right? We, we clean up the rest of the house, but that room is to Closing the door doesn't make it cleaner. You know, I had a friend of mine when I moved to New York City who had, had lived through 9-11 and, of course, was traumatized by it. He said, you know, I don't, I don't know why you bother about this oversight stuff. You know, I, I'd let them do whatever they think is necessary to do. And I said, well, what did you know about how the FBI was handling intelligence before 9-11? And he said, nothing. And I said, and what do you know now? And he said, nothing. I said, so what makes you think you're any safer? And, you know, I think the January 6th event sort of bookends this problem, that here was an attack planned in, in plain sight. Anybody with a newspaper subscription could have read what was going to happen, and somehow the, the intelligence apparatus we built was not ringing the alarms to send the people there to do this. Um, it, you know, it, it, there, there's evidence. And, you know, one of the problems that was pointed out is, is the failure... You, know, you can't fix a problem you won't acknowledge. And uh, if you look at the Inspector General reports that examined the national security letters and found widespread abuses throughout the FBI, if you look at, at the Inspector General reports that examined the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrant process and found widespread problems that all these hoops that, that need to be jumped through aren't actually jumped through all the time. And in fact, erroneous information gets into those warrants and that is a systemic problem. And I would argue it's a systemic problem because it's secret, right? That, that the one advantage I had mostly working criminal cases in my career is that I went through, they call it a trial, right? You know, I'm up there putting the evidence that I collected, everything that I've, I've done over the past year working undercover against Nazis is now available to their defense attorneys to cross-examine me with. 
And if I made mistakes, they get to beat me up about it. And the judge gets to say if I broke the law, and the jury gets to say whether the evidence uh, justified uh, the government's activities and put these people in jail. And that kind of cleansing process, I think, is a little more effective than what we have in this intelligence system that we've created that doesn't actually perform as well as it needs to and has too, far too great an impact on the privacy and civil rights of ordinary people who aren't doing anything wrong. There's no reason the government should have your cell phone records. Right? I had a friend of mine said, well, you know, I don't care if that government has my, my phone records. I, I'm not doing anything wrong. And I said, well, what is the, the government learning about terrorism from your phone records? She said, nothing. I said, then why does the government want your phone records? That's the question that you need to ask yourself. Why is this information being collected if, from people who, who, who aren't doing anything wrong? And I would argue that because there are only 12,000 FBI agents and because this is uh, 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 an organization that doesn't necessarily get all the resources we might imagine that it would, they need to be more careful in how they use those resources to make sure they're focused on people they actually have evidence are doing something wrong. I think we have time for one more question. I think we have one up here. Oh, sorry, I have one back there. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, that there is a like a somewhat widespread opinion that 20 years ago, 10 years ago, the main threat to the United States was foreign terrorists. And now the main threat is domestic terrorists. And it especially was raised after January 6th and for example, the attacks targeting electrical grid, which happened several times in, last, in late years. So my question is first, whether you agree with this, and if you do, then what adjustments should be done in the work of these agencies to adequately respond to this change? I personally take issue with the notion that domestic terrorism is more of a threat than international terrorism. Um, Al-Qaeda, first and foremost, has never gone away. Despite all the political pronouncements that Al-Qaeda is dead and buried, that's simply not accurate. As a matter of fact, there's still members of the original Gang of Six that founded Al-Qaeda that are still out there alive and kicking and up to no good. So they will never give up wanting to attack the United States. Same applies to those who belong to ISIS, Khorasan. I can list off all these because it's their ideology. The United States is the enemy. We assumed the role of imperial colonial power dating back to 1948 and the recognition of Israel. I mean, it stems from that forward. So that threat's never gonna go away. Um, January 6th, it's, it, you know, it's interesting. My first, the first thing I did when I got out of Quantico is I was assigned to be Tim McVeigh as part of the trial preparation for the Oklahoma City bombing trial. Lead attorney was Merrick Garland for that. Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols were two ex-U.S. Army guys who'd gotten out, uh, kind of bummed around, didn't have much going for them. Nichols' brother lived up in Michigan, was a member of an early form of the Michigan militia. They, the ideology going, again, we're talking back to 19, early 1990s, okay? The government overtaxes us. The government is not doing what we think they should be doing. Pick whatever issue, okay? There's a religious bent to this. Abortion was a single issue that these guys latched onto, for example. So fast forward to January 6th. Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, 1776ers, pick your group. What's their ideology? It hasn't changed much from Nichols and McVeigh. Now, is it a very serious threat? Absolutely it is. Is it a growing threat? Yes. Now, you can sit here and debate what the issues are that are feeding into that evolution. Our politics, for example, um, we're not here to get into that. But I think that part of the problem is, is that we want in this country to try and prioritize stuff like this. You can't really prioritize which ideology is going to strike first. They both want to strike first. So the question then becomes, do we have the assets available to allocate to address both problems? Okay. And that's, I think, where the 
the, the FBI in particular, but the rest of the USIC right now is, is trying to figure that out. There was a huge move roughly five years ago within the Department of Defense to completely de-emphasize international terrorism. We'd gone into Iraq and Afghanistan, we've killed all these guys, it's no longer an issue. Well, we still see soldiers getting killed in Syria. We still, there are other things going on involving those groups that are still a problem, okay? Uh, you know, on the domestic terror side, it's, you know, Mike went undercover by, uh, back then to get into those groups. It is easier said than done to do that. Uh, the criminals, and I say criminals, people who are part of these domestic groups are way more sophisticated than the McVeighs and the Nichols. They understand how the internet works. They understand how the FBI and local and state law enforcement works. So it's just not simple to try and infiltrate these groups. So how can you do that? Well, they're being told you've got to surveil them. So how do you surveil these groups? How many tools are actually in the toolbox to do that? What's, you know, how, many, how many options do you actually have to surveil a group like the Proud Boys? If you can't get a human source into them, what can you do? Well, you're going to have to figure out how they communicate. You're going to have to ascertain the facts that substantiate a search warrant or actually the warrant to get what's called a Title III wiretap on the criminal side and listen to them or to look at see what they're doing on content on the internet. Again, through court order. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, that's, that's the part of this that you've got to understand. Investigating groups like this, pick your side, ITDT, it's very hard to do. Huge criticism came out in the 9-11 in the post, you know, whether you're talking about the 9-11 commission report, but just the after action washout. We had no, we being the USIC, had no human intelligence sources into Al-Qaeda, zero. The only surveillance we had was listening to phone conversations, and that wasn't being done by the Bureau, that was being done by CIA NSA, and not being shared, okay? So you get, you're trying to get him in it, trying to recruit somebody who's part of that group, which is really probably the best strategy to do right now, try and play on somebody's sense of what's right and wrong, because at the end of the day, when you're trying to recruit somebody who's committed to be part of a criminal organization, you've got to try and get them to understand what you are doing is wrong. I had to do that a lot in my career. And it's not easy to do. But that's probably the straight way into one of these groups, is to try and get one of their members, or multiple of their members, to cooperate and let you have some advance warning of what's coming. And, and I, I would just agree with the, the idea that you don't, you know, it's a silly exercise to try to prioritize these things. The FBI has, has certain responsibilities. They need to cover them all. Uh, but, you know, there has been a deprioritization of white supremacist and far-right militant violence in the United States, uh, certainly since 9-11. Uh, it, you know, I worked this stuff in the 1990s, and we didn't get the resources we needed then. Uh, but you know, one one of the key things that th that needs to be done, you, you know, yes, surveillance and and use of informants and infiltrating with undercover agents. But first, we need to understand the problem. You know, how many people white supremacists killed last year? Anybody? The year before that? Uh, the FBI doesn't know either. Nobody keeps track, no government agency keeps track of the violent actions that white supremacists and far-right militants or any other domestic terrorist group engages in. Uh, a bill was passed in 2020, the National Defense Authorization Act, requiring the FBI and DHS to report incidents of domestic terrorism across the United States. They've submitted two reports where they say they don't do it. They don't. This, you know, again, their primary activity, they can tell you how many bank robberies happened, they can tell you where they happened, they can tell you how much money was taken in each bank robbery, but they can't tell you how many people white supremacists killed. That's because, not because they don't have good agents, they have really good agents who can go out and get that information, but if they collect that information, what they would find in their domestic terrorism program, which would reflect what academic groups and advocacy groups 
collect from, from media reports and police records is that white supremacists kill far more than any other group that the FBI investigates as domestic terrorism, so it, wouldn't it, it would no longer allow them to justify investigating these groups that don't engage in deadly violence. So getting that data would be able to help you understand how the networks work. That's how a brilliant case agent in my first case, it, working Nazis in, in Southern California, that's what he came in with. He came in with, there was a, a racist attack by skinheads here, there was a racist attack by skinheads here. You know, these two people were with the person who got charged in that crime, but they weren't charged, but they were also up here at this other event where, where they got charged. So, so you could see the network because of who was at those violent attacks, but if he hadn't been collecting all the information about the violent attacks, he wouldn't have been able to put together the predication necessary to do that undercover operation and know where, who to target for that, that uh, to gather that kind of criminal evidence. So, you know, this is, you know, what, what was unfortunately denigrated after 9-11, the, you know, shoe leather, law enforcement, traditional techniques that have been successful in so many other uh, uh, episodes where we've had a crime problem rather than you know, let's monitor all of social media and try to figure out who among the millions of people who are saying really awful things is actually going to do something, which I would submit has not proven very effective, unfortunately, as we've seen this week. All right, well, please join me in thanking our guests for tonight's program. As a reminder to all students in the audience, our next student advisory board meeting will be Tuesday, April 4th at 5.30 p.m. So we hope you can join us and remember to apply for the awards and the internship assistance program by this Sunday, April 2nd. So everyone have a great night and thank you for coming.